yeah. Just taking in a very nice little day today. Gonna walk up, uh, walk up a very famous street here in New York, give you a little tour of it. Um, known as the Bowery, everybody. And you might be thinking, Tom, I've never heard of the Bowery. Well, you're gonna hear about it after today. And uh, a lot of cool history, man. So many stories, so many things originated here. I'm actually here in Chatham Square in Chinatown, which is kind of, kind of where it starts. But we'll talk about all this as we go. Before we start, Cameron, how are you? Can't get better. Well, that's, you know, I mean, it could always get better, I think, uh, but it, you don't, don't want to spiral out into that. But, uh, but yeah, I like your attitude, that's for sure. Um, before we start, guys, uh, real quick, uh, check out the Patreon. It's a huge help. That's how I fund these things. That's how I afford the four coffees that I drink every morning. And uh, aside from that, uh, yeah, like and subscribe. It's a huge help. I mean, if you've seen more of one of these videos, you know this is going to be good. Uh, even if I am starting the video out leaning on a trash can. People are honking already. They're, they're showing their support. What do you think, Cameron? Should we do this? Let's do it. Now, just keep in mind that Bowery is important, or was important, all the way from when the Dutch settled here because this was a Native American path. And the reason it was a Native American path was because you had springs here, what they called the tea water springs. Now, these springs factored into basically the trade that passed through here, which was cattle. Cattle, oh yeah, and also distilleries and breweries and all that stuff. So right from the beginning, they used this water for different things. It became pretty disgusting, but that was why this was actually very important. It was called Bowery from early on because Bowerige or whatever, I don't know how to pronounce it, all right, so relax. It's the Dutch word for farm. Oh, look at that. Now, there were six farms in this area, including the Great Bowery at the end, uh, which belonged to Peter Stuyvesant later on. We'll talk about that as we go. So the reason I'm standing here is because of this house behind me that's covered in scaffolding, uh, insert graphic here or whatever so you can see it better. How's it going? Nice, nice to see you. Uh, anyways, this building was built in 1785. Uh, now that's important, this is the oldest building on the Bowery, but there were lots of different buildings that were here in that time, so uh, specifically uh, bars. There was a bar called the Bull's Head Tavern. Remember I was saying that slaughterhouses and cattle driving and all this stuff was used on this road because it was the one road that went all the way out of Manhattan at that time. This is before Broadway stretched all the way through and it was connected with another road to make it go all the way through, right? So it was in, it was in this time that the Bull's Head Tavern right near here was set up. And uh, that's where you know, people did their handshake deals and people like George Washington stopped and had a drink on his way back into the city at the end of the Revolutionary War. Ah, look at that. He came in and he had a Gideon's Hard Lemonade on the way down to kick the British out. Isn't that pretty cool? So uh, this little house harkens back to that time, 1785. It was called the Edward Mooney House. He was uh, actually a guy who was in the cattle trade. In the 1900s, this building actually became a place called Barney Flynn's Saloon, which was home to a guy named Chuck Connors, who was the mayor of the Bowery. This guy would give tours of the neighborhood, but he would stage everything. So he'd pay people to pretend to be opium addicts. He'd pay the Chinese so he could pretend there was an opium den. Uh, pretty smart. Probably got some good tips. Uh, you know, I guess that's the secret, just show a bunch of drug addicts. The roots of being home to saloons uh, and the transient go all the way back from the beginning. Look at that, we're already getting started. But it, it was gonna grow and it was gonna kinda continue to evolve. Let's keep it moving to our next spot. We got a lot to cover, baby. We gotta keep it moving, let's go. So I'm standing in front of 50 Bowery here. How you doing? Doing standing in front of 50 Bowery, which actually was the site of the, one of the sites of the Bull's Head Tavern, which I was telling you about, called the Bull's Head because of all the slaughterhouse and everything in the area. And this is, would be where this fancy hotel is now, uh, where Washington would have had his beer on the way back into the city on evacuation day, huh? November 25th, 1783. That's when the British were booted from New York. This was their headquarters during the Revolution. They used to celebrate every year, actually. Like, they'd have a parade and everything up until the 1930s when it was replaced by the Thanksgiving Day Parade. I think they should, you know, start celebrating the Evacuation Day Parade again, huh? I'd much rather see some accountant dress up as George Washington ride a horse, you know, rather than a Snoopy balloon, huh? Uh, and right next to here, right here at 4648, and that was the site of the Bowery Theater. So that was open in 1826, and it became kind of where they showcase all kinds of things. In 1827, actually, Francis Colleen, who was a ballet dancer, came here and scandalized the whole neighborhood and city when she showed up on stage wearing tights. I you know people change, and the styles and things change. I, it's a good thing those people didn't see the internet, because you know, their faces would have melted. Uh, but it's also where, you know, like tap dancing. You know, a, a famous man named William Henry Lane uh, actually uh, pioneered tap dancing. He, he combined 
African American jigs with Irish jigs and kind of created tap dancing, showcased it here on the Bowery as well. Initially, remember, theater was considered a waste of time. It was like lowbrow. What are you doing at theater? You know, get a job, you loser. But actors weren't respected back then. They were considered like kind of loafers and, and kind of losers. Uh, now today, they're, you know, they're selling you SUVs and telling you how to think in politics. That was, back then, they were considered like losers and stuff, you know? And also, uh, keep in mind, with, with theaters sprouting up, it kind of went hand in hand with prostitution. Cameron, I saw your smile get big when I said that. You creep. People who started out at these like basic entertainers, people like uh, Eddie Cantor, who became a famous uh, stage actor. You had um, Irving Berlin. You know who Irving, Irving Berlin is, Cameron? He's the guy who wrote uh, God Bless America. You know that song? Really? You never heard God Bless America? God Bless America, land that I love. All right, I'm gonna turn you into ice, man. You're gonna get, you're gonna get uh, deported for not knowing that song. Here was where the Bowery Theater was, and here was also where the original Bull's Head Tavern was, which kind of set the stage for all this. But it all kind of devolved and went downhill eventually as well, uh, and we'll talk about that as we go. But I just wanted to set the stage. Whet your appetite. All right. All right, so I was talking about how this was a thoroughfare. It, it drew businesses like saloons and theaters, but even before that, it was drawing things like the cattle industry, slaughterhouses, things like that. Well, over here, this is kind of one of the facades here of the Bowery Savings Bank. If you can't read that giant sign right there, but it started out initially, these here was the spot of what was called the Butchers and Drovers Bank. It's a pretty cool name for a bank. It make me much more proud to use my credit card. It's like, no, no, I use my butcher's card, my butcher's visa, I get points towards ground beef on it. But this building here, obviously in a beautiful Beaux-Arts building, was built later. So there are a bunch of banks here on uh, the Bowery. Uh, further south on Canal, just right nearby, we just walked by, is the old Citizen Savings Bank, which was actually a beautiful Beaux-Arts building, built in 1922. Uh, it's now an HSBC, not as cool, but yeah, the building's still pretty neat. Uh, and that's right at the entrance to the Manhattan Bridge which is another Beaux-Arts structure, which was built in 1909. By that time in the 1900s, there was already the Third Avenue Elevated Railway, which was the actual, uh, I guess, the, the predecessor to the subway, but it was an elevated railway that ran over the Bowery all the way up to uh, when it became, you know, Fourth Avenue in that area. So up to Cooper Square, that area as well, and, uh, and continued on north, but it basically cast a shadow over, over Bowery and made it a little seedier than it was before, and also busier than it was before. Now keep in mind the architecture on these buildings from back then was done on purpose. It was done to actually make uh, the people feel more confident when they saw the building. So you'd invest your money. That's pretty cool that they would actually, you know, make these buildings kind of have a positive effect on people. Uh, but you know what, for me, just design it. I don't care if my bank's in a shed, just give me a good interest rate and I'm happy. But so the banking here was also kind of another industry that popped up as a result of the cattle, as a result of the actual business that was being done here. We're going to talk about this as we go as well, because it continued on throughout the history of the Bowery. We'll talk about that as we go. Let's keep it moving, baby. we got a lot to cover, so let's go. It's also insane here. we got people like riding by on mopeds, yelling stuff, spitting. It's great. All right, let's go. It's just you spitting. It's just me spitting. Yeah. How you doing? Okay, so another thing that the Bowery has been famous for and kind of continues to be famous for, another industry, is hotels. That's right, hotels. In fact, I'm standing in front of uh, what, what is the oldest continuously run hotel in New York, 1835. That's right, this used to be the Occidental Hotel. Today it's the So Hotel. A uh, little play on words, look at that, how neat. Anyways, this was actually the home to a man, very famous, uh, what I used to call the boss of the Bowery. His name was Big Tim Sullivan. The guy did it all. He was a boxer. He was a state uh, representative, state senator. He was a U.S. congressman. He ran hotels, theaters, everything. He was actually, he made himself a big political name by getting into uh, repeaters, repeat voters. He was a Tammany Hall guy. I don't know if you guys remember Tammany Hall from the other videos I've done, but it was basically kind of in charge of helping the Irish for a long time, kind of get settled in a new city, in a new uh, country, and in return just ask for their votes. Sometimes more than once. So you vote, repeat it, repeat votes, and uh, that's one of the ways he got elected. And it was his job to kind of wrangle people, make sure they voted the right way, really doing a civic duty. 
but he was also uh, famous for getting the Sullivan Law passed, which was a law that basically made it illegal to carry unlicensed weapons and uh, guns in New York. And you may think, oh, that's very nice. Very, what an altruistic guy. But one of the reasons he did it was so his enemies could get harassed and arrested by the police for carrying guns. But because he paid them off, his guys wouldn't get arrested and, uh, and harassed. So kind of interesting. I guess you just make it illegal to be your enemy. And that's one way to kind of become a, a mob boss. His headquarters were in another spot, but he had a, a suite, uh, like a group of rooms here where he would conduct business and do things here. But it was a very famous hotel back in the day. This is where Boss Tweed had one of his birthday parties. Also a very famous head of Tammany Hall. Someone's driving their sick, their sick, uh, souped up Fast and the Furious car around here. Uh, okay, see, we're doing a YouTube video, huh? Kids in your fast cars. Anyways, this is a, was a very famous hotel. Another thing on the Bowery that was very popular was flop houses. And the flop house was synonymous with, with the Bowery, and it was basically a poor man's hotel, very poor man. In fact, for like five cents a night, you could rent a square on the floor a four by six square, and you just lay down in that square next to someone else. Or if you really wanted to splurge, you could rent a, basically a square that was roped off from other people with chicken wire. And uh, you know, Big Tim Sullivan, one of the most famous people in Bowery history, when he died, his, his, his funeral procession to Old St. Patrick's Cathedral in Nolita, uh, 75,000 people popped out for that. It's a pretty big event. Uh, fingers crossed, my funeral is gonna have that many people. Although it won't matter because I'll be dead. All right, let's keep it moving. All right, so uh, as the mid 1800s started to come, you had the Bowery start to kind of shift. Like I was saying, at first the theaters and the bars and things were for both the lower classes and the middle classes and the upper classes. As the mid 1800s came, you had theaters moving over to Broadway. You had Broadway being the main thoroughfare. You had the higher end stores moving there. So you kind of had a shift. In, in 1849, specifically May 10th, 1849, this is where the Astor Place riots happened. So what happened was you had these two actors playing Macbeth at the same time. Uh, you had this man named Edwin Forrest, who was an American actor, uh, playing Macbeth at a theater down, a little further downtown. Uh, and then you had William McCready, who was a fancy pants English actor, playing Macbeth here at the Astor Place Theater. Now at the time there was a lot of tension. You had all these Irish people who were very anti-English. Uh, you had a lot of big uh, anti-Anglophile sentiment. Uh, it's like hoity-toity, all this stuff. So they, on May 7th, they started pelting this guy, William McCready, with, with uh, you know, stuff from the seats and all that. It was always a crazy, rowdy bunch. And uh, he said, you know, screw it, I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna keep doing my thing here. So on May 10th, he's like, I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna keep doing Macbeth. Do something. And that's exactly what happened. So they, they start meeting there and it turns into a full-blown riot to where the militia has to come and they just start shooting into the crowd. Dozens of people die, hundreds of people injured. It's a total nightmare, total mess. Uh, but keep in mind, this was like, they, they had the hoity-toity actor versus the common actor. It'd be like today, if people got mad, they're like, we don't want Sir Patrick Stewart as Macbeth. We want." The Rock, you know? In fact, the Astor Place Theater closed uh, a few years later. They called it the Disaster Place Theater. Look at that little play on words. Uh, by the way, we are in, this is now today Astor Place. It's right at the like end like of Cooper Union here. Um, so it's kind of the end of Bowery. It kind of turns into Fourth Avenue here. Uh, and then it eventually merges and comes to uh, Broadway at Union Square, the Union of Broadway and what was then Bowery. Uh, oh, look at that, kind of interesting. So those are the Astor Place riots. They picked an English guy to play Macbeth here and, you know, a riot ensues. I guess that'd be like if today, you know, they picked Tom Holland to play the lead in Kinky Boots and people have to die, you know? Something's never changed. And uh, how you doing? But uh, yeah, anyways, Astor Place riots. Really in crazy story. But uh, let's keep it moving. This is not technically the Bowery. We're at the end of the Bowery, it's kind of Fourth Avenue here, but all right, I'm rambling. Let's go for the love of God. All right, so the second half of the 1800s, you have the Bowery continue to develop. Uh, in the mid 1800s, you had huge waves of immigrants coming in, the Irish and the German. Uh, now the Germans made their home up here, kind of further north end of Bowery, which would have been, which today would be, I guess, the East Village, a little bit of the Lower East Side. But back then it was called Klein Deutschland. 
Ah, little Germany. Yeah, they sprach ein bisschen Deutsch. But they lived up here and some of the businesses kind of started to cater to them. You had beer halls pop up, things like that. But you also had more banks popping up. Behind me is 190 Bowery. This was the Germania Bank, a bank for the Germans. I don't know if you figured that one out. But uh, this building, interestingly enough, a very pretty little uh, building, I don't know if you can tell. Covered in graffiti. And there's a Supreme store down at the bottom. I want to get some sick threads. The building itself was actually bought in 1966 by a guy named Jay Mizell. This is kind of interesting. He bought it for $102,000. Just sold a few years ago, actually. They, they estimate for over uh, like $55 million. In case you can't do math, that is uh, an increase of 47 million percent. Yeah, I did that in my head. But it actually, he lived in there with his family. He raised his whole family in there. Uh, you know, all that giant building. That's, how, that's, I guess, where the Bowery was in the 1960s, where you could get a building like that for so cheap. Not so much today. In the second half of the 1800s, you also had the Bowery being covered by the elevated railway. Remember that. The elevated railway, by the way, was here until the 1950s. Uh, and, and that was actually made it the kind of more, it made it darker. You had, uh, you know, the, the trains going by people's apartments. So you could see right into their windows, which actually helped some of the ladies of the night, huh? If you will. Cameron's smiling again. Look at him. He, love, he loves it when I talk about that. It wasn't exactly the nicest thing. I was telling you how a lot of the theaters early on was a mix between the rich and the poor. Well, after the elevator railway up, it kind of, you know, pushed the rich away. They didn't want to be around that element anymore. So it kind of devolved a little bit in the second half of the 1800s rather than the first half. But you had the Germans here. You had the Irish here. You had, uh, you know, bars and saloons and theaters and dime museums and everything still here. But it also continued to change. would have been 295 Bowery. It's now this fancy condo behind me. But uh, it was the site of what was very famously known as McGurk's Suicide Hall. This is where McGurk's Suicide Hall would have been located, and that's the name of the freaking bar. And the reason it got that name is because the guy who ran it, last name McGurk, um, he changed the name because it got fame for being a place where prostitutes committed suicide by taking a shot of whiskey mixed with carbolic acid. That's a shot you don't want to be taking right there. That's one of the reasons why I never take shots of people, because you never know what they're giving you. They could just be giving you carbolic acid. He changed the name to Suicide Hall. That's, I guess, good marketing. I don't know, you gotta play to your strengths. But that's what would lo was located here. You had bars like this going up all over the neighborhood, and this is what the neighborhood became famous for, and what the street became famous for, for that kind of derelict aspect. You had another guy who claimed to jump off the Brooklyn Bridge. His name was Steve Brody. He claimed to have jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge and survived. Uh, might have been a scam, but he became famous and he had a bar there where people would come and talk to him and see this celebrity. In fact, funny, you could look it up, uh, Bugs Bunny, the Looney Tunes, they did an episode where Steve Brody makes an appearance. You could look it up, it's called Bowery Bugs. That's the name of the episode, pretty cool. So the Bowery was famous enough to be on Looney Tunes. You also had huge gang activity in this neighborhood. The famous one being the Bowery Boys, who start out as kind of these guys who wore like top hats and they were parts of fire, fire departments, which by the way, the fire department, and uh, up until the Civil War, were volunteer companies. And people were like, it was cool to be a fire, uh, associated with a fire department, it was like a frat. And you know, they loved to fight, and you got it recruited if you were tough, because they, had, they, had, they competed with each other for calls. Like there would be a call, and they'd race to a place, and they would have to get access to the fire hydrant, and the first one there wins, and gets to put out the fire. Uh, which is crazy, they, they hired people who would fight, and be good fighters and stuff. And then they got into a huge fight in 1857 with the Plug Uglies and the Dead Rabbits, who were real gangs in this neighborhood. Uh, and these also, they, these were people who also took part in the famous uh, draft riots of 1863, the biggest riots, most deadly riots in the history of the United States. Hundreds of people died uh, protesting the draft for the Civil War. All this uh, was kind of the heart of what made the Bowery famous, the just terrible, terrible Skid Row neighborhood. That's a loud truck. All right, let's keep it moving, baby. All right, so as I was saying, the neighborhood kind of went into decay. You had lots of, you know, drunks and all kinds of, you know, uh, rough around the edges types and characters. Well, 
you had uh, different groups kind of providing for these people in, in the form of missions and uh, you know aid societies and things of that nature. Behind me, you have the Bowery Mission. It started in 1879. This building actually was built in 1909. Very pretty. You have the stained glass by a guy named Benjamin Sellers, who was a protege of Tiffany. There was no Tiffany. There wasn't the jewelry company. It actually started as a glass company, but uh, it's actually the prodigal son. If you want to see what the Bowery looked like uh, back in the day, a really great movie is called On the Bowery. It's this movie from like the 1950s where you get to see the elevated railway, and this guy, the filmmaker, uh, basically shot like a real slice of life. He would just set up a camera and his two characters were actually Bowery bums and he would set up in the actual bars and you could hear the conversations and see the real faces of the people who were going to these places and drinking themselves to oblivion. Uh, but it's, a, it's an interesting movie from the, from the mid-1900s. Check it out. I'm plugging other people's movies. What am I doing? So your Bowery mission behind Cameron to the other side here is the YMCA. Uh, the YMCA obviously was, uh, you know, a group that was also located. There's various locations, but this one had lectures. It had. It's not the one from the friggin' Village People song, unless the Village People song has a line about Teddy Roosevelt giving a lecture. That's not what this is about. But it was a, a place that was kind of trying to improve people's lives. And actually, it had uh, artist studios in here. And one of the famous artist studio, one of the famous artists who had a studio here was Mark Rothko. Mark Rothko actually uh, created his uh, Seagram murals here, Seagram murals for the Seagram building. He was going to make, he was commissioned to make murals for the Four Seasons restaurant in the Seagram building in Midtown. And, uh, and he, uh, he famously said he took it with malicious intent and he famously said that he, he was using darker palettes with the, with the intent to uh, ruin the appetite of every son of a in the place. Uh, so yeah, I, Rothko was trying to make these, you know, art pieces to kind of stick it to the man, I guess. Uh, but the joke's on him, because really rich people don't look at art. <laughs> they don't actually look at it. They just buy it. But yeah, the Bowery Mission, YMCA right here. You had all these different groups kind of popping up to save people in the neighborhood that needed saving, I guess. All right, let's keep it moving. We got a lot to cover. Okay, another thing that kind of uplifted the neighborhood when it was down in the dumps, after even after having the, uh, the, the elevated railway torn down, was the arts. A lot of arts popping in here to the Bowery. Uh, keep in mind that Soho around like the 70, early 70s, late 60s was kind of becoming an artist thing. We're very close to the Soho, right? Uh, only difference is there's more loft spaces in Soho because you had more buildings like this one there, cast iron buildings with big lofts and stuff like that. But this one here is on the Bowery. This, in 1963, was turned into the Bowery Lane Theater, which, by the way, Bowery Lane was the original name for the Bowery uh, because it was the lane of all the Bowery's, of all the farms. Anyways, 1963, this becomes the Bowery Lane Theater. Frank Langella, actually, I don't know if you guys know him. He was actually uh, in the, one of the opening productions there. This is the place that made uh, Bernadette Peters a star, a very famous actress. Uh, today, it's condos, you know, no go figure but uh, beautiful cast iron building still protected, which is kind of cool. And almost right across the street here, you have 315 Bowery, which was the home to CBGB. Yeah, it's now a John Varvatos. So where you used to go to, you know, get punched in a mosh pit, you go and spend $800 for a pair of pants. Um, but I covered that in a different video, so you should check that one out. There you go, gotta plug the stuff. Uh, also nearby, just, just north of here, you had um, another uh, jazz club called the Tin Palace uh, over near Cooper Square. And you had the Five Spot, which is at Five Cooper Square. That was a very famous jazz club in the 50s and 60s. Had people like Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane, Charles Mingus. You can't really hear good jazz in these village anymore. If you want to hear jazz now, you got to go to, I don't know, a dentist's office waiting room. But back then, really cool people went to hang out and listen to this. Leonard Bernstein. Uh, Jack Kerouac, uh, James Baldwin, they were some of the people who regu uh, were regulars there, so pretty cool. So you had all these different people kind of coming in and kind of changing the neighborhood and making it uh, a hotbed of, of activity uh, after it having been kind of the skid row of the city. So, uh, you know, you know what's coming. You know what's coming. Rents are going to go up, baby. We'll talk about that here at our next stop. Well, we reached the end of the Bowery. We, we went through how it used to be, uh, you know, the springs in a Native American land. Then it became a thoroughfare out of the city, which brought businesses like cattle driving and, and slaughterhouses and then bars and then theaters. And then, it, and then it grew and brought in 
you know, seedier bars and also brought the elevator railway and turned it into kind of, uh, you know, Skid Row. And then, it, and then the artist came in and then it made it interesting. And today we're seeing a neighborhood that's very fancy, still has lots of hotels, but there ain't no flop houses, baby. That's for sure. Uh, you also have very fancy condos being built as well all over the, all over the neighborhood. I'm gonna, I digress. There's a lot. We could have covered this for hours, guys. We could have covered this for hours. Cameron, what'd you think, man? Great day. It was a great day, man. I mean, we're losing light very quickly. Guys, that's the end of the video. If you enjoyed it, please check out the Patreon. That's how we fund, fund these things. Uh, like I said, keep the lights on. Also, some extras over there. Also, too, like and subscribe. I'll keep it short for you, okay? I don't need to, you know, uh, go too into, into detail. You guys know how all that stuff works. All right, guys. It's all over. It's over. I'm out of here. See y'all later. Sick. <laughs>